At this time, I'd like to invite John Walsh to come up and read our scripture passage this morning. This evening, sorry. Old habits. Good evening. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul doesn't narrate the Christmas story, but he certainly explains it in a number of places. Here is how he did so to the Philippians as the substance of how we ought to think. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thanks be to God. Well, again, good evening. I count it a tremendous privilege to just spend a few moments this evening meditating with you on the person of Jesus. What better thing to consider on the night we remember his birth? But for many, that's about as far as it goes. Jesus is caught up in a a time warp of perpetual infancy. And, And you know... Every Christmas it happens, we go up to the attic or or maybe to that back closet and and we pull out the box of Christmas decorations and and we open the box and we begin digging, digging through those decorations and there is the, oh yeah, that's the ornament one of your children made in third grade. It has their picture on it, the star. And you dig some more and oh, 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 there's the ornament from Grandma. It hung on our Christmas tree every year in my childhood. Digging, digging, and ah, there it is. And you pull it out, and you unbox. There he is. Again, it's the baby, Jesus. And year after year, that's all we think of or know about this mysterious child whose birth the world continues to commemorate and, and some of us celebrate after 2,000 years. Do you ever wonder, whatever happened to Jesus anyway? It's somewhat like the pictures in that yearbook from your high school senior year. You look at those pictures and, oh, oh yeah, now there's a familiar face, familiar 40 years ago. I guarantee they wouldn't look like that now. This year, I learned that one of my few remaining uncles died I'd not seen him nearly 40 years. It's a, it's a long story. You don't have time for it. Hardly seen him since the death of my own father, his brother, in 1978. But through the wonders of the Internet, I was able to pull up a fairly recent picture of him. He was around 80. 
when he died. Wow, he looked different. And so, Jesus, if to you he is stuck in a time warp, stuck in perpetual infancy, I'm, I'm here to warn you that he is more than just a holy infant, meek and mild. We sing of his identity. Words to familiar Christmas carols but do we understand them? You see, the story of Jesus doesn't begin with the familiar manger because the birth of Jesus was not his beginning. When he was first introduced by John the Baptist, John pointed to Jesus and said to the amazement of his crowds, this is he of whom I said, after me comes the man who ranks before me because he was before me. Now, for anyone who knew the story, Jesus was, in fact, born months after John. And later, Jesus himself would say something just as astounding to his critics. In John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And in response, they picked up stones to throw at him. Verse 59 goes on to say. Why? Well, because Jesus was claiming pre-existence. He was claiming to have existed before creation, claiming, in fact, to be God. This was revealed centuries before by the prophet Micah. His words are familiar to us, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient times. Whose coming forth is from old. That, that phrase is an acknowledgement that the child who came to Bethlehem, that Bethlehem manger, is in fact one who existed long before. John writes concerning Jesus in John 1, verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In the Genesis account of creation, there are hints of what John reveals here, that in fact the triune God was at work back there in creation, the Father, the Spirit, and the Son together forming the universe in which we live. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. The eternal Son was there at work with the Father and with the Spirit in creation. The Son whose whose coming forth is from of old. And so he is this eternal son, the eternal one, but the eternal one did come forth at the birth that we now celebrate. And on the surface, it perhaps seemed more unremarkable than we know it to be through what the scriptures reveal. The question seldom considered is this, how could the eternal son become human. In every other conception, a new person comes into being. The angel announced to a virgin that she would be with child. Mary asks, how can this be? Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. John, the apostle, describes his birth with unusual words that reveal this unusual conception and its significance. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
Wondrously, we have births among us, but we never announce them with this kind of description. Oh, yes, Jonathan Flynn became flesh. Well, no, Jonathan Flynn was born recently and how we celebrated his birth. The truth John the Apostle is revealing is very specific. That the Son, eternally existing, has now become what he was not before, a, a human being. The divine human nature of Jesus, the now incarnate Son, is evident in the words read earlier from the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Those words in very nature, God, are sometimes translated in our English in the form of God. Don't be led astray by the imprecision of our English. Jesus is testified to be God the Son. But he was made through the virgin conception and birth a man. He became human as well. So it is that Jesus, God the eternal Son, came to that storied manger bed to begin his earthly life as one of us. By all accounts, he lived a remarkable life. John John called it in John 1.14, a life of glory, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, full of grace. His grace was evident, especially in his interaction with sinners, those whom the religious folk would condemn and have nothing to do with. I think of the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Unexpectedly, because of cultural norms and her bad reputation, Jesus engages her in a conversation that ultimately leads her to faith in him as the coming Savior. On another occasion, recorded in Luke chapter 19, Jesus goes to dinner at the house of a rich but despised tax collector, Zacchaeus. And this man, too, comes to salvation through faith. In Jesus. Time after time after time, Jesus reaches out literally and genuinely to touch and to serve the lost, the down and out, those in need. He reaches out to them with grace, full of grace and full of truth. His truth is evident in his teaching. Perhaps the best known is the Sermon on the Mount, with what many regard as the pinnacle of ethical instruction. At its conclusions, Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29 tell us the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. He spoke the truth. When the Apostle Peter sums up the life of Jesus in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, he refers to the miracles that backed up his evident glory and proclaimed truth. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, they were witnesses of his life. They saw his miracles. Healing the lame, feeding the multitudes, giving sight to the blind. John tells us at the end of his gospel that, that they could not contain all the incidents of Jesus' life full of grace and truth. And how did the world? How did the world receive this righteous man? Acts chapter 13, verse 28, Paul summarizes the end. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death. They asked Pilate to have him executed. We all know of his death. Death on a cross. 
commemorated on Good Friday. In fact, a cross is a more prevalent image in relationship to Jesus than is the manger. But for many, its significance is just as unknown. The fact of his death on the cross is stated plainly by Peter. Again, in his message on Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 23, this, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So it was that Jesus was arrested in the garden, hauled off, unjustly tried, on trumped-up charges and condemned. The reality is the cross was the means of carrying out Jesus' completely undeserved execution. However, as Peter states, it was fully in keeping with the plan of God. It was his plan to provide for the forgiveness of sins that we all need. It's Isaiah the prophet who revealed the significance of Jesus' death in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, all we like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. With his earthly life evidently over, Jesus was buried. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. It was a borrowed tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, who had also come to believe Jesus was the Savior. The tomb was secured with a guard of soldiers to prevent Jesus' followers from from stealing the body and then falsely claiming (laughs) he came alive again. It was pretty unlikely since they, they hardly expected that. They were filled with disappointment, unfulfilled expectations, and they thought, frankly, it's just over. Jesus is dead. End of that story. But just as the birth of Jesus was not his beginning, so the death of Jesus was not his end. The tomb was found empty when they came to care for the body after the Sabbath because, in fact, Jesus is alive again. It was announced by the angel to the women who encountered him at the empty tomb, He is not here For he is risen, as he said, come, see the place where he lay, and then go quickly. Tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. His return to life was also anticipated by Isaiah, just as his death was. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, When his soul makes an offering for guilt, that is, when he dies, when he's pierced through, when he's laid in the tomb, yet he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And his return to life was then witnessed by many. Again, Peter describes it in Acts chapter 2, verse 24 and 32. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. And so the skeptic will say in response, well, okay, so where is he now if he's alive? Great question. After he appeared and taught his disciples for another 40 days, Jesus returned to the Father where he now lives. It's known as his ascension. Paul describes his presence now at the right hand of God the Father in Romans chapter 8, verse 38. There he is interceding for us. Paul writes, Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Again, the prophet Isaiah foretold of this intercessory 
ministry, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And the New Testament writer of Hebrews confirms this. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 25, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. The nature of his intercession, with its outcome to save us, was evident in his words from the cross. In Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus said, as he looked out upon the crowds that were crucifying him, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they're doing. And that is Jesus' present ministry on our behalf. Sitting at the right hand of the Father. On the basis of his shed blood, which provided full payment for our sin, he intercedes to bring us forgiveness. That will continue until the last and final day when Jesus comes back, Jesus is going to return to the earth. As the disciples witness his ascension, they are greeted by two men in white robes who stood beside them. They're watching Jesus as he goes back into heaven. And the two men standing beside promised Jesus would return in the same manner he was going. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The Apostle John writes of his vision of the return of Christ to rule and reign in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 and 16. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so he will judge the nations and establish his righteous kingdom to reign on into eternity. Revelation eleven fifteen, which is made more familiar through the Handel's Messiah, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Whatever happened to Jesus, this is the person, Jesus, who is the Christ. Not a baby, caught in an eternal time warp to be forever the infant in a manger. He is God who entered time as a man to offer us the greatest gift of all, forgiveness and life eternal. It's offered to all who will come in faith to receive the gift of life. And so appropriately, the whole scripture ends with an invitation. It's in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I'd venture to say that around Christmas trees in almost every home represented here, there are gifts to be opened. There's no gift like this gift. The greatest gift of all. Eternal life. It's free. And it's available. I stand before you as just one of those who has heard. And I say to you, come. Come to Jesus. Receive life eternal. The bride is a reference to Christ's church. And I stand representing that church. And we say, come. Come to Jesus and receive life eternal. And the Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God who speaks directly to the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, the Holy Spirit may be speaking to you at this very moment. 
saying, this is, this is the Christ. This is who Jesus is. This is what he's done for you. Won't you come and receive the gift of eternal life? For those who have received this life, this season is much more than nostalgic memories and cheery parties. Christmas is a time of worship. It's time we celebrate this greatest gift of all. Truly in Christ, as you'll find in the writing in your bulletin, gift of gifts, God has given us so much in Him that heaven can give no more. And so we're going to close in singing. Come to Jesus and live.